Kia ora everyone. I've got the other half of the Smiths, the better half of the Smiths, is it, Ron? <laughs> well, depends what you're looking at, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Glad to be here. Awesome, mate. And uh, as I said to you just before, you're up before the enemy. Tell us how many consecutive days you think you've been getting up at 4 a.m. And, and what started that for you? No, uh, I think it's it's 40 something, maybe 50, but uh, so, sort of during this COVID situation where my general routine of sort of week to week preparation with the football team and, and family around that um, had changed, that I'd fallen out of a bit of a routine. So I needed to. I was still being productive, but I was felt like I was sort of chasing my tail a little bit, um, not knowing how my day was going to look because I, the, the normal structure of uh, football preparation had been taken away. So I, I thought I'll take some action and make sure that I'm having a win each day before, you know, I do the kids breakfast at 6.30, 7 o'clock. So get up and get into a, a gym session and answer a few messages and stuff and feel like I've had a decent day by, by breakfast time. So. That's been the, the driving force, I guess. Mate, I can relate to that big time. We were just talking about Ballina there before. When I was living there, I was getting up at 4.20, doing a bit of Wim Hof, heading into the, the gym, stretching, one hour CrossFit session, back to the beach. Then, yeah, as you say, in, into breakfast with, with, with the kids. And oh, what, what, what a feeling I, to get that out of the way. And you've already, like you say, won, won the day and it's only 6.30. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you can feel like it's productive because you don't get interrupted by anything other than yourself at that time of day. And uh, I grew grew up like being a little bit of a swimmer as a teenager, you know, as a young teenager. So I had those early morning starts, and uh, and then when I was going through uni, I used to work, you know, sometimes three, four mornings a week. You know, I'd be up at four to take the covers off the pool before the uh, the rec center opened uh, for swimming training. So I kind of kind of used to that. Or always had some kind of early mornings part of my life, so I'm definitely a morning person. You yeah, mate. Um, we've had this uh, a few ex swimmers on there, and they're, and they're getting up in the morning and the in the process and, and the and the scheduling that comes with with swimming. Um, how do you reckon that shows up now? Like obviously you just said, you know, getting up in the morning, getting getting things done. You know, what else of of that discipline comes through in your life? I didn't love swimming, to be honest. Like, I was, <laughs> that's why um, I liked it too. <laughs> it was that. It was kind of kind of weird. We we went to we went to England as kids um, to live for a couple of years. I was seven when we went, and we fell away from like the beachside lifestyle. We grew up in Wollongong, and you know, we we're in the pool or at the beach or whatnot. And then in the UK, obviously, with the weather being different and the access to pools is just not the same. Um, as it is in Australia, that we fell away. You know, my skills, I don't know about Keg, but my skills fell away with swimming. So when we came back at nine, sort of nine years old, 10 years old, I was I was pretty ordinary for a nine-year-old swimmer. Um, and mum and dad, you know, made us go to swimming lessons. And I, like, I was the kid that was getting out of the pool going, no, I'm not doing this. Like, I don't rate this. <laughs> I'm out of here. Uh, blowing up. But after maybe a year or two of, not really ever wanting to go to, to swimming lessons at that stage, kind of turned a corner and got a bit of confidence with that. And I never actually loved it, but I was probably reasonably good at it technique wise. So coaches like, Oh, why don't you come and start doing training? And then we were doing like, you know, three, five sessions a week. I never went to that fanatical next level or anything. Cause I was keen to play tennis or footy or, cricket or whatever in the park you know like I was I was more of a ball sports type of person but yeah reflecting on that going through that process of really disliking something <laughs> and telling mom and dad you know that I I didn't want to go and blowing up and throwing tantrums and whatnot and then coming through the other side of it I, I guess he's in in reflection at the time you think it's well, it's torture child abuse but uh, looking back I'm glad like, and I've said that to my parents a lot of the time, I'm glad that they pushed me through that period because it's a great life skill to have, to be able to go to the beach and feel confident. Um, you know, I don't go swimming training as such anymore, but if I wanted to, I probably could start again. So it's a, it's a skill for life, I guess, which is, which I didn't realise at the time, but you know, I'm glad I did. 
Yeah, mate. Um, my my dad doesn't really have the greatest swimming skills. Yet the rest rest of our family do. And and it's, it's funny you brought up the word torture there. And and black line fever is definitely something that that gets you when you do start getting into that six seven sessions a week. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's fascinating how you can always hark back to that doing the doing the tough stuff and, and getting through it, and then starting to get a little bit of reward and and. On the other side of that hard stuff, like you say, you start being good at it, and you're like, "Oh, there's something to this. It's still not great, but there's something to this." <laughs> yeah, well, I had like, you know, I used to go to district, and I used to make sort of regional for for some freestyle. I couldn't do breaststroke at all; I hated <laughs> breaststroke. But like, I I remember going to a district carnival. Maybe I was in like year nine or year eight or year nine or something like that, where. You know, a coach came up to me and said, "Oh, who do you who do you train with?" And I said, "Oh, like I'm not that interested in swimming, man. Like just just do it for school sport and yeah, you know, go and compete and get a day off school or whatever." <laughs> um, he's like, "Oh, you could come and train with us." And I'm like, "Nah, like I train at the University of Wollongong like two or three days a week, and that's that's already a struggle. So thanks anyway." But yeah, I think the the discipline of it, like I always appreciated. And I probably didn't have the the personal discipline to go. You know what? I'm I'm okay at this. Why don't I just give it a go for a few, like give it a hard go for three months or six months or whatever? Like I never got to that point, um, which probably was my own choice by that stage because mum and dad obviously got me to a point where I could swim competently, and that's that was their driving force. They didn't need me to go to the the Olympics or the Commonwealth Games or anything you know crazy. So they weren't the the crazy parents pushing that stuff um but I always respected the the work of swimmers and we like i ended up when i was at uni down at country cool so you were mentioning how you got to uni and you were swimming well and thought about getting better maybe <laughs> you know what yeah i guess the, the respect for swimming you know was established through those tough times and then yeah. understanding what swimmers went through while I was uh, doing those early mornings as a lifeguard and opening the pool up and seeing the kids come in, you know, first thing in the morning and then get in the arvo. I think that really underpinned me as a coach a little bit about the dedication and the, the commitment that people were willing to show for like, you know, even at that time when swimming was pumping in Australia and, around the, you know, the Sydney Olympics and whatnot, like there was money in it for still a very small portion of athletes, like could make a living out of it. And these kids at 14, 15 are like dedicating their life to it, uh, chasing the dream. Like uh, I feel that helped me a lot as a coach to realise, you know, what's what's possible as far as commitment goes. Mm. So obviously you had your dad as, as a coach, but... Um being on the sideline, you know, watching the pool and when it comes to swim training, it's basically like sit, sit there on your ass. <laughs> did you, did you do much observing of the coaching or was that not really something that entered your mind or do you think a little bit of subconscious came through? Yeah, well, I actually ended up teaching uh, swimming. So my first gig, like I did the Oz swim course and I thought this is, you know, an okay way to make money better. You know, I didn't want to work. Um, I was only 17 at the time when I started there. So I wasn't, um, going to work in a pub and I didn't want to work at McDonald's or any of that shit so um, yeah I, I, I did the swimming instructors course and then I was teaching like four to six year olds how to mm. swim you know eight ten meters like learning a little bit of backstroke but just getting their freestyle up to a point where they could kind of swim you know ten ten meters or so and then pass them on to the next the next level so I guess that was a grounding as a coach as well but we were fortunate at the uni, the uni pool there, we had like lots of elite teams come through there. So, you know, on a daily basis, Ron McCann, who um, has worked with Australian swimming a lot and, and a, an Olympian, I believe himself, um, he had, you know, a huge stable of like the greatest uh, surf life saving swimmers, you know, were kind of one group and then next to them were the, the real swimmers. Mm -hmm. um, but there were, there'll be 30 or 40 of them and, and Ron, Ron was a great coach and um, a really, you know, an influence on me for sure. I, I would stand there and watch and I would listen while I was doing my other, other tasks, obviously, but um, he was, yeah, he was, he was mentoring me kind of without, 
actually knowing it at the time, um, except for the days where I decided to cook some toast in the in the office and set the smoke alarm off that had to empty the pool. Um, you know, he wasn't mentoring me that day. He was disrupted in the middle of his key set for the day. But uh, yeah, we had we had a lot of like AIS swim teams. We had like the Finland swim team, US triathlon team sort of call by in the, the build up to the Sydney Olympics. So I would get around and just watch those coaches and just, just talk to them about swimming. How's it going? You know, like didn't really think I was setting myself up for a career of coaching, but I was, yeah, I was just getting around it. I guess I was always fascinated by the athletic journey. I mean, that's, that's such a cool little um, foundation. Like you say, you 17 years old, you, you don't really realize what what you're experiencing right then but it's cool that you can hark back and go man i, I learned a little bit about it just observing these and, and i think you brought up a key point there just having a conversation with some people and, and getting some nuggets um have you ever run into any of them again um i've I, like i've yeah definitely dropped uh ryan a line a few times like both his kids have been to um to the olympics and commonwealth games and i you know sort of send a message to say you know you must be a proud dad moment sort of thing and um, there's other good coaches there as well, like a guy Jamie Turner is a triathlon coach. Like he, he used to be there as well, and he's Jamie's a great coach in his own right. And I sort of had a good friendship with him, and he's the kind of guy that I could, I could drop a line now, and I haven't spoken to in in ten years, but um, you know I could drop a line and have a yarn to. And my my two bosses were both good coaches in their own right, uh, Bruce Power and and Rolfie. Like they were they were good coaches of swimming and water polo and. Um, so I was kind of around it, but wasn't really, I wasn't really thinking, oh, hey, I'm going to be a coach. And, well, I, it had crossed my mind being a footy coach, but I actually didn't know that these guys were influencing me like they were, I guess. Yeah, that's cool. Um, you brought up, you know, you just in footy as well, that you're you were more into the ball sports and, and even water polo. That was, that was my out of swimming, it was, it was water polo, but... What do you think it, uh, about um, team sports that just has that extra level? Like we had, uh, is it Wayne Goldsmith? Yeah. yeah. yeah yep. speaking, you know, and speaking in this, this up-teen swimmers on the, on the chat going, oh, yeah, that's the, that's the problem with swimming. Oh, I, I left at 15 and stuff like that. Like it's, it's such a challenge to develop as an athlete, develop those habits as a young athlete and, and give them a set of carrot of, of carnivals and, and national representation. But, the burnout in swimming is something that's hugely ob- obvious when you're wanting to get a, a, an athlete to the stage where you've got Michael Klim, bloody, you know, two metres tall, 25 to 30 years old, crushing it. You know, it's, it's such a challenge. Def- are you even finding that in rugby league now that like schools and, and things really putting an emphasis on on being great and making it to academies that you, you see a school kid and then never see them again? Yeah, it's a tough one. Like, obviously, you know, Wayne's Wayne's so deeply entrenched in um, coach development and particularly in the, sw- the swimming world, he's got such a great handle on, on that that he would know more about, you know, the burnout. And it's like, there's probably no way around it in that sport mm. to a point. Like, you've got to do the work. But I like, I love Wayne's stuff about how he, you know, let's do the work, but let's have fun. And let's let's do the minimum you know the the thread around the minimum amount of work to get the result that we're after not how much work can we get and then still get hopefully result. get the result you know like that's there's there's a different shift in the thinking there i also feel that it's i don't know if we highlight it more because kids kids at that age are going through like a, a lot of change in their life as well so their their world's opening up in a lot of ways um their responsibilities and opportunities outside of whatever they've been doing as a a kid that's dependent on mum and dad like things are start things are changing by that 14 15 16 whatever it is for for different people sometimes a bit later even um that it's not necessarily a bad thing to drop out of the sport even if you're even if you're good at it as long as as long as the intention is to get on and use the discipline or the what you've learnt from that sport, use it for something else. Mm. 
if you take your skills of dedication and discipline as a swimmer, like if you can do 10 sessions a week in the pool and have a good crack at that, but decide, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm going to, you know, do triathlon or I'm going to do water polo or I'm going to just give up sport altogether. Like those skills could easily be transferred into being a, an entrepreneur of some kind. And that's like, that's how life is now. There's kids that are 15, 16 that have got businesses and making more money than I've ever heard about because they're like, things are, things are different. So I don't like, a, I'd love to see people keep, you know, kids keep continuing their sport, whatever it is. Um, even if it's more social level rather than competing at the highest level, but yeah, I don't know if it's all. I don't know if it's all negative. It just depends what people are doing when they decide to drift away from sport. Um, what what the alternative is? Yeah, man, I, that's I thoroughly agree. And, and I guess that kind of fits in with with a comment I heard you say to Adrian O'Brien is, is um, that every book is a coaching book and and every book's a life book. And I guess, I guess that's the same with you know sport and and doing hard things. It's you know, it's a sport and it's a competition and there's a and there's a prize at the end. But really, like you say, those skills of discipline and dedication and responsibility, mate, they're massive life skills. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Like you, every every experience, you know, in a certain field can help you in a different field. Like it's it's impacting you as a as a human. And if you you evolve and experience things as a human, that doesn't leave you just because you're focused on a different um, element of your life and, yeah I remember listening to uh, Brett Bartholomew I think that was the first time I'd sort of been alerted to that that phrase of every book's a coaching book and since then I probably instead of going for I, I was sort of getting into that self-help um, mindset kind of book choice or, already but when I heard Brett say that I was like maybe I can drift off onto further tangents because I'm still going to get something out of this as a coach rather than just, you know, get Bill Walsh or Bill Belichick's books <laughs> out that there's, there's benefit to, to branching out. And like, I certainly don't branch out like some, some people do into the, the fiction world and all that, but um, it's probably something I should be aware of too, to be honest. <clears throat> Mate, um, you, you brought up Bill, Bill Belichick in, is Wayne Bennett the Bill Belichick of rugby league? Do you reckon? <laughs> um, I I always find it hard to to I guess articulate or, or to to compare in the Australian sport because our sport has well in rugby league sense like we've really only had an active salary cap even playing field for like less than twenty years. Mm. So in a sport where it's not been an even playing field for all that other time, there's a lot of factors. Like I'm not, it's, I'm not undermining anyone's successes. It's just, you know, the NFL is a, like, they're, they're doing their salary cap every minute or every hour or whatever it gets updated. Like it's, it's cutthroat. So essentially it comes down to coaching and process and whatnot to, to get the, the outcome you know to to be to differentiate teams from the good teams from the great ones where you know in our sport certainly in rugby league for a long period of time you could go get the best players if you had the resources and obviously if you've got the best players then you you're far more favorable to win um his record like Bennett's record is unquestionable like he's he's had success at you know anyone that can win a comp at two different clubs you know that's that's pretty elite, but to me, you know, I'm I'm really excited by the NFL season to come ahead because Tom Brady's not at the Patriots, and I've got little doubt that like the Patriots will find a way to win, mm. even though it's a you know a really mm. substantial shift away from the the tight force that they've been with, you know, quarterback, head coach, um, and ownership all being very aligned and connected for a long time, uh, the shift away from that will really show the, the prowess of Belichick, I reckon. And even if it's not this year, if it's like, if he rebuilds to another, 
mini dynasty or whatever like that will be epic and I often wonder like why do coaches not seek out that opportunity somewhere else like I've dominated here I've created this why don't I go somewhere else and show everyone I can do it like somewhere else but I guess in the NBA, in the NFL it happens for you because the players get turned over so much because it's it's so um, draft and cap uh, orientated that your people change so you don't need to change your own environment because it's it's easy to change your people mm. uh, so it'll be, yeah, it'll be interesting to see I think part of you know Wayne Bennett at South how that ends up will will sort of also determine what you know it won't determine his legacy or his his record like he's going to be one of the greats of Australian sport regardless like the the stats tell you that but there's there's so so many different ways to 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 measure it like um you know the great Jerry Sloan just passed away recently the Utah Jazz coach and he's one of the most winningest coaches but never won a title hmm. but he's so highly regarded like Marty Schottenheimer in the NFL like he never won a never won a title but like made his teams great you know got them there to compete maybe teams that weren't expected to to be there George Carl uh, is another guy I've checked out quite a bit recently he's like the fifth most win- winningest coach in NBA history but he's never won a title so he sometimes doesn't get the accolade or the credit but he's taken teams that were average and made them very good you know that's also a success so mm-hmm. to me I don't I've never grown up just looking at if you won the premiership, that's a success. Like there's lots of ways to be successful in sport. Mm. Yeah. And it's interesting. You talk about the pets and, and they're, you know, I don't follow the NFL, but the pets is the team that, are, you know, if, if they got, if they're gone and, and you can watch them or then that's the one I'm, I'm following. But it's, it's funny, you know, you've got, you know, Kraft, Belichick, um, Brady, but then you've got the the man doing the yards in Gronkowski, and and you, when he's not there, pets tend to not do quite so good. And, and you know, I think it's any given Sunday or something. It's this game of inches, and guess who gets inches and meters or yards, as as they call it, is is the Gronk. And and you know, in rugby league, there's there's you know your your um your hookers and, and your halves who do all the magic. But then there's those guys that that catch the ball run 20 metres into three people and guess what? You're on the front foot. Like, <laughs> um, you, you, brought yeah. up, you brought up South. Um, how much of an influence do you think those Burgess boys have had on Australian Rugby League? I was lucky enough to watch the qualifying final uh, 2014, I think it was, um, Rabbitohs Manly and shit, it was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for South fan, like, that was some some glory times. Um, I think Sam, Sam Burgess Sam Burgess is probably like you know when people are related to someone by blood or um, have spent a lot of time with someone and they sort of group people together. Like I feel like Sam should have always been like he's his own, and then the other, you know, <laughs> then the twins, and then Luke. Like that was yeah. sort of the impact level. Like to put to put. Um, Tom and George in the same category as, as Sam for me, or not not the same category, but sort of group them together. Probably didn't do Sam Sam's impact um, fair fair sort of appraisal or accolade. Like he Sam was, you know, tough, physical, and obviously you know people followed him. You know, mm. I don't know him as a as a dude, but. He's got a lot of time for his teammates, from what I believe. Like, he cares about his mates. He want, loves the team dynamic. And that's, you know, he played so hard. Like, that was the the driving force behind their their success. Had to be, you know, a big part of that was, was Sam Burgess's commitment. And it was a big a big risk for him to come over from the UK. Like, he, he hadn't been, you know, dominating that comp for five years and then decided, hey, I'm, I've got to come over here. He came over quite young and, you know, he, he had some he had some teething issues here. Like, he didn't dominate from day one. He had to grind it out and earn it. And then when he did, like, he's, to me, at various times there, he probably had a couple of seasons where he was the, the best forward, clearly, in the game. 
and and overall a top top five or top ten forward for a you know considerable period of time. Massive impact, massive impact, and someone you know. Yeah, a lot of lot of um, lot of praise for that guy. Like he he loves what he does on the field, and he he cares about his teammates. You know, I love that stuff. You yeah, mate, like uh, I was there for a conference and. Roosters were playing on the Saturday night and we had a had something on and so I was like, Oh bugger, I would have loved to have gone to that but then it was like, Of course you you buy your dick and it's like which side of the, the ground do you want to sit on? And I'm like, Well Manly's good but then yeah, it was like Burgess the Burgess boys and Greg Inglis, I was like, Yeah, I'll sit with the Rabbitohs and shit it was good as I was there with, with some guys that had, you know, driven into town and, and he'd bring brought his kids along and what what a fantastic atmosphere and, and you know, it's it's pretty awesome the way that the NRL set set up that uh, you get all the fans together. It's it's pr- pretty wicked. Yeah, I I love that aspect of um, like the fanatical fans in the UK, like Premier League games and stuff. You know where they, or in soccer in general, where they just put the they put the away fans in the corner, you know, <laughs> a thousand or two thousand of them together, so they can just feed their hatred and passion and all that together, and then everyone else is like. My, first, my best experience of that situation, is I went to a Leeds United Arsenal game and I've been an <laughs> Arsenal fan. And when I was I was 14, the kid across the road when we were living in England, um, the kid across the road said, oh, I've got a spare ticket to the Arsenal game. Do you want to go? I'm like, yeah, of course I want to go. So Arsenal score, you know, reasonably early in the game, make it 1-0 and I jump up and go, yeah. And around me, <laughs> was absolute crickets like not a sound down the other corner there were the 1500 Arsenal fans going crazy down there but in this section like there's like literally not another Arsenal fan in there so I, I sit back down and curl up into a ball into my chair Arsenal scored two more goals and I'm like did not move a muscle I was like I was, I was in fear of this fanaticism of, of sport and um, yeah, I love I love the fact that we fans get grouped together, like to to enhance the experience and share it and make more noise. But I also kind of like in Australia, you can sit next to the opposition fan and you're not um, fearful. <laughs> Where in the soccer world, you you can't do that. Uh, I went to a Boca Juniors game when I was in Buenos Aires, and yeah, like the, <laughs> there's some serious fences and armed police and whatnot, like keeping, keeping behavior to a, uh, a calm level, which, you know, we, we here don't really experience that, that full thing. Like it's great atmosphere, but origin and semifinals and stuff, but it's more like, yeah, yeah, go, go, not singing and not in, in unison together. Um, like, like soccer. Yeah. Well, that's what's, what's bringing that atmosphere to Australia is this, my my favorite A-League team, Western Sydney, the, they're uh, definitely, mm. definitely bringing the hype, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, they had a go at that right from the start. Hey, like when they they obviously got a crew together and went, hey, this is how we're going to do things as a fan group, like <laughs> get involved. Yeah, and unfortunately they got themselves in trouble. There was something that uh, Adrian was just speaking about at a Man U game, like, well, you know, you're, you're treading on the line of this being a good thing and, and, a, and a horrible thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mate, you, you, you spent some time at the Warriors. When, 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 were, you, when were you there, mate? And, and who, who were the guys around you? Yeah, I had a couple of shifts there, actually. Um, I started off, Daniel Anderson was the coach of the Warriors in 2000 and, uh, 2001. It was his first year there. And I, I was still at university. And I was fortunate enough to have met Daniel um, a little bit while he was coaching at Parramatta. And he sort of offered me a chance to watch a video and do a little bit of scouting analysis on opposition. So while I was still at uni on a, you know, on a weekend when their upcoming opposition, I would sort of do a bit of a, a review or a preview and, and pass on some thoughts, which for a, like a 19 year old kid, like I was like, Whoa, how good is this? Um, you know, doing it for free, of course, just like just loving watching footy and someone reading what I was doing. Mm. Um, so I did that for two years and then I was fortunate enough at the end of that, I finished uni and I was ready to settle into like a 
sort of management position at the pool I was working at and I was going to do some coaching with the local team that I was already working with and you know I knew half the people in Wollongong life was pretty good like and then I got a you know a call one day from Daniel I think it was just before Christmas yeah it would have been Christmas 2002 I got a call to say hey I, I think we've helped create a position like so there was this, a joint role between the New Zealand Rugby League and the Warriors as an analyst. And um, I think you should apply for that. So, you know, I met the credentials with having a uni degree and some of the other things that they had asked for. So, yeah, I ended up getting that job. So that was kind of like an apprentice coach when I got there. Like I was doing lots of the grunt work in the video room, like um, lots like Eric Spolstra and Bill Belichick and those guys that started just cutting mm-hmm. film, like not, not getting face to face with the players, not not making decisions, but just just learning the game. Um, and I thought I knew a lot, but realised I didn't know a lot. So I just put the work in. Like I'd be there every day. There was no days off. Like I'd just watch footy all day, and that was the grounding for me to to learn the game as well as I could. And you know, I still got that appetite to watch, not not just watch, but analyse the sport. Mm-hmm. Um, so I got a gradual introduction into you know getting face to face with NRL players there but I was more doing coaching work with um, their junior elite program which you know back in those times yielded you know so many NRL players it was a simple skill and and strength and speed focused program like it was the, the simplicity of it was phenomenal but the detail and the coaching um, expectation and accountability was very high with it um, so that that set me up I was there for 18 months Daniel got you know had he had a season 2001 they made the, the semis for the first time the Warriors 2002 had a good crack at the grand final and, and nearly got it hmm. 2003 we finished uh, in the top four got beaten by Penrith who ended up winning the premiership um, and then 2004 was a you know an ordinary start to the year. Daniel got sacked halfway through the year, um, and that was the end of me as well, pretty much. And it was time to move on, which it turned out well for me. Um, but I, yeah, I sort of never burnt my bridges and kept some connections with people in New Zealand. So when another opportunity, Matty Elliott was the coach in 2013, he got the job over there, I believe. Um, in 2014, I went to be the the first coach of the Warriors New South Wales Cup team when they transitioned from being the, the Auckland Vulcans to um, the New Zealand Warriors New South Wales Cup. That was when I went back there for a, for a year. I intended to be there for a couple of years, but I uh, ended up going to the, the Titans after that. So, mm. yeah, I've, Dan, Daniel was like, Daniel and Tony Kemp was his assistant. Like, those guys taught me a lot um, in that that first shift and then the, the second shift there I was under Matty and then Andrew McFadden those guys are both good coaches um, but also by that point I was you know 10, 10 years further down the track that I was more than comfortable to be you know quite autonomous and just take care of that reserve grade team without um, them needing to hold my hand where you know the first time around I needed I needed people to hold my hand and, and show me the way um, which mm-hmm. Which they did, which I'm really grateful for. Yeah, that 2001, two, three definitely was a purple patch for the Warriors, and and um, I've got a couple of mates that uh, are now fans for life. I, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if I feel sorry for them or, or respect them because you know the rugby team I follow is a bit like that. We had a little little purple patch in 2009. We we won the Ranfurly Shield a couple of times in three years, and yeah, um, that, that really got me hooked along. But We've, we've been, you know, scraping the barrel and, and trying to hang in, into the premierships from there. You, you brought up the the fact of watching versus analysing, and in recent years in club rugby, you know, they've, they've brought in things like huddle and, and um, sports coach and, and stuff like that, and put a real onus on players to to watch and analyse the game. And and many many players, well, they struggle to first get on on the platform and actually watch it, but then. To come back to training with an analysis is a special skill, and you know, can you watch a uh, rugby league match now and and sit there and enjoy it and, and go for the you know what's on the scoreboard, or or is it or that pattern or that person's out? And I'm I'm even finding the same. I'm 
on watching rugby, I'm watching the defensive line, watching where the flankers are, are running and things like that, and, and what are their what are their running lines like that, or are they too deep, or are they out of position? Like, <laughs> my my joy my joy comes from like analysing the process and what what's actually happening. Like it doesn't seem like joy at the time, and like a lot of my mates over the years, obviously uh, they like rugby league and they're like, oh, you got a pretty cool job. Mm. I'd love to like watch some sport with you, like watch them, you know, review the game or see what you do. So, you know, if they come to a game and head back home, you know, a couple of hours after the game back home, like I, I put it on. And sometimes if it's after a night game, like that's not, that might be midnight or 1am by the time, you know, I've sat down to watch it. And after going through the first set of six or the first five minutes or whatever, and it's taken 45 minutes <laughs> and I look over to I look over to my mates and they're asleep on the lounge, you know, like there's, they, they don't, they don't get it until, you know, they, they look at it like the, the coaches I have detail and a lot of people still say, you know, it's a simple game and whatever, but there's, there's so much happening in any sport. There's so much happening with hands, feet and decision-making things going everywhere, left, right and center. That There's always a way where you can be challenging your own thoughts and working out, you know, can I find something to help this help this guy do something better mm. or can we do something better as a team? So I don't yeah, I'm not I'm not very good to watch sport with to be honest. Like I um even other sports, I'm trying to work out what they're doing or watching behaviour or seeing how that coach responds to this situation or find out yeah, what's what's happening. That's my that's my joy comes from the Inquisition, I guess. <laughs> and in the age of um, uh, information, you can sort of get little pointers of, of the patterning or the, or the coaching philosophy that certain someone has, and then you start watching the game and, and you pick it up and you go, oh, yeah, I can see how that works, and I wonder if that will work, work for us. <laughs> yeah, there's so much stuff out there you can find out, but you still have to dig into, you know, to, to really get the details, you've got to dig in, like even – you know, we, we spoke on the coaches summit to a couple of NBA assistant coaches and those guys who are more than willing to, to have a chat for an hour. But also if you really want to dig in, you know, if you want to find out what they're doing from the inside, you're going to have to dig a lot harder than even getting into one-on-one -on -one conversation for an hour. Like, so yeah. for the average, for the average person, like there's so much insightful stuff out there that you can find, as Wayne Goldsmith says, all you need is a phone and you, you've got access to whatever you want. Um, but the intricacies and the, the real detail still takes manpower. And you talk about, yeah, some, some guys, you know, not really knowing how to analyse it maybe or that's, that's the job of the coach. Um, and, you know, in our semi-pro world here that I work in, we don't have the players here all day, so we don't have time for lengthy review sessions or whatever to show people what they're actually looking for. So, you know, I record that stuff and pre-record it, talk about it, go into detail. And then for those that are that way inclined, you know, they'll spend an hour watching my pre-recorded review. And those guys, the ones that spend the time watching things and understanding the deep, the depth or the detail that I'm looking at, they, they know the sport better. Mm. Some guys just want to, you know, just want to experience it and work it out on the run. That's okay. Um, but the ones that put the time into the video work, like, you, you definitely improve. And it's something that's obviously been a massive part of American sports for a, for a long time. We're still playing a little bit of catch up there. Yeah, so um, when you've analysed the game and, and you see certain patterns or, or behaviours, maybe from one or maybe a number of players... What's one of your techniques of communicating that without nick picking as you say, a dynamic game with things going on all the time? Yeah, it's something that probably evolved as a coach, like as a young coach working in NRL teams and you know, players being older than me or, you know, the same age and having not been an experienced, you know, in a high level player myself, quite often I was feeding too much information or too much feedback trying to show them hey i know lots of stuff like these are all here's a list of ideas like that can help you get better let's go through them all but probably well i definitely wasn't 
good enough at working out which player needed that mm -hmm. massive amount of detail and which one just needed um, a couple of points. It probably wasn't until 2010, um, a guy, Phil Jauncey, did some work at the Roosters about profiling and working out. Like, and we had Mitchell Pearce and Todd Carney ended up being like halfback in 5'8". And those guys were distinctly different as far as what you needed to give them <laughs> to feel like they'll prepare. Like one was just give me the big picture and let me like, I'll work it out. And the other guy needed lots of detail and, and reinforcement of the detail and clarity and, and whatnot. So from that point, like the last 10 years, I've spent a lot of time trying to work out, constantly working out what makes what what does each guy need from me mm. um rather than what do mm. i know and what can i show them but what what does that guy need and how can i communicate that to him to him best so you know probably the simplest answer to that i asked the players how they how they thought they went mm. and you know as dan or ben and um wayne goldsmith are talking a lot about asking questions you know asking permission for the for the player to Get feed, give give feedback, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Quite often, some guys will be spot on, accurate. You know, they're not humble or they're not arrogant. They're just like, this is how I thought I played. Other guys will always undermine their mm -hmm. own performance. They'll think, oh, no, I didn't play very well. So I let them get that off their chest. And then I say, yeah, cool, but these are all the good things that you did. Um, yeah, I, I'm very much... I've always endeavoured to be an individual coach and find an opportunity to connect with players on their own game, whether that be, you know, in person, in a long review, a quick passing chat, um, a text to call, you know, just share a video with them and say, hey, what do you think about these things? Like getting that one-on-one -on -one stuff is is where I have always tried to underpin my coaching and, and that's how I, I learnt from from Daniel and, you know, from my old man as well. Yeah, on those on those players that sort of get hung up um, on that one thing and, and think that because of one thing the game was ruined, how do you then in the next game or, or you know for the rest of the season go about addressing that in the micro so the rest of the game isn't hung up and, and you know for, for some players it means that they have a blinder after that, but other players they they become removed removed from the game and, and you all of a sudden wonder where they went. Um, yeah. You know, I think what we're chasing is like that high performance and, and Kerry Evans talked about this a lot at the, at the Warriors when I was there, you know, getting that eight out of 10, you know, I think that mm -hmm. was the thing Maddie and, and Cappy McFadden were sort of talking about. If you're at eight, eight out of 10 every week, like that's a good level and that's high performance. That gives you a chance to win, you know, in a very, very tight, hard fought competition. If you, if you drop below that, well, you're risking, you know, maybe getting beat by a good team. Mm. And not too often are you going to get a nine or a ten, but I I feel the mental side of the game and and managing your thoughts is something that we you know we're not taught at school, mm. we're not taught at uni, and if you didn't do either, which a lot of you know rugby league guys and various different sports like kids just survive school, they don't actually attend. Um, that that they're not learning how to manage their thoughts. And they don't do it in their job, in their workplace. So we have a lot of guys. Well, we did. When we started here a couple of years ago, we had a lot of guys that were in the labor, you know, laboring, mm. doing hard labor, which credit to them. And I've done a bit myself and I actually don't mind it. It's, I don't mind gr grinding and grafting. Like, But guys, just thinking about it, guys have been told, always told what to do at home. Then they go to school and they get told what to do. Then if they get a job in a labor sort of trade, they get told what to do. Then they come to footy training and they get told what to do. And that's give or take, like, are they in trouble, you know, with, with the law or got other issues where people are also telling them what to do or what not to do. Like everything's been directed. Mm -hmm. Where trying to generate that thought of, hey, I control my own thoughts and I think for myself is something that I've, I've worked really hard to try and get kids to un, or young men to understand that they can think for themselves 
So the better that they can think for themselves and manage their own thoughts, they can deal with that error or poor game or whatever because they're not riding the roller coaster of being up and down. And they're also not just walking in here waiting to be told what to do. They're going to act on that failure. Um, and I, I spent last week listening to um, a book, It Takes What It Takes, which is Russell Wilson and his mental skills coach, Trevor Moad, I think he, his name's pronounced. But like Russell Wilson throws the interception from the one yard line, you know, that cost the Seahawks opportunity to win the Super Bowl. And his thoughts are, well, if you want to be able to throw in a position to throw the winning pass, you've also got to be in a position to throw the the intercept. Mm -hmm. Like it's the same thing. You're in the same position and his ability to manage his own thoughts and articulate that after a Super Bowl loss in that fashion is just shows a, a very disciplined, dedicated, aware of himself sort of character. Um, and that's what, you know, I try and spend time with guys, getting them to manage their own thoughts. So it's not about next game having a blinder because the last one, like you can't make it up. You can't mm. make up for it. I hate, like I, I don't hate much, but I, I always, if someone says, oh, I just make up for it. I'm like, nah, it's done. It's already happened. You can't fix that. If you let a try in and then score a try, that is not made up for it. Like you're back to square one. Mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. need to score two. But even then, you might need to score three or four because that one was so critical. Like it just doesn't even matter anymore. It can't matter. Learn from it for sure. But don't carry your divots, I guess, is, you know, that golfing term. Yeah, mate, that's awesome. Like... And and you always hear you know the armchair fans say you know if we'd got if we'd got those three penalties, you know what do you mean what do you mean if we got those three penalties? It, it was only one penalty that 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 missed, you know. As soon as that happened, if you'd kicked it, the game's different again. So you can't have everything's on. different. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's butterfly effect, and um, yeah, it's quite quite fascinating. That you're talking about like sports psychology and Kerry Adams when I, when I started this podcast. Um, we were in our second year of having a sports psychologist at our club rugby um, game, and he's he's being more uh, mentored by Dave, Dave Gabriel from the from the Chiefs, and he's got a really good book out there. And 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 then you brought up Gary, Gary Evans, and it was like watching that Richard McCaw film, thinking that it was going to be about uh, Gilbert and Oka, and then all of a sudden, here's this this other guy that's just straight down the barrel, tells you these incredible tricks, and and you know Steve Hansen brought up his name, and I think. Kerry sold about um, 500 books over two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. I hope yeah, so. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe Steve's got a got an affiliate on that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> what was it? What's it like actually being in the belly of the beast with the man? Yeah, well, like to be honest, I didn't know didn't know who he was, and I I didn't really know. Like I I don't follow rugby union closely, so I, I didn't really know. Um, at, at that point, how much impact he'd had um, mm. on the on the All Blacks in 2014. I was I was there, and I like I listen like I love it when consultants come into organisations because it's like this is a different voice, different perspective. What's this guy got? Mm. And you know, to be honest, I don't think a lot of consultants get used very well in pro teams it's like come in solve a problem for me <laughs> rather than get the ball rolling or let's implement something as a coaching group and i'm gonna deliver that so that you can follow on with it um but kerry like i love kerry's chats like i'll be just like writing everything down and making me making me think like it was but he he's so clear for a guy that's like obviously so so well uh, educated and knowledgeable from a science point of view. Um, he's he can put it he can put it to real world terms, and I I, I guess with the relationship with Gilbert and Oka and and the coaching staff, like they put all that in the blender and then came up with you know a, a path forward from that mental skills. It wasn't Kerry's program; it was it was the All Blacks program. Um, Hmm. It, yeah, I I always enjoyed like I looked forward to his his appearances and 
um, probably didn't realize the impact that he'd had until I'd read Legacy and then sort of mm. followed that up. And I was, I was long gone from the Warriors at that point. But um, yeah, a very, very cool, calm, collected, intelligent, impactful man. Um, and I hope he did sell 500 books the other week. Yeah, yeah, that legacy book. That's another another cracker. And you hear Brene Brown even even referencing it. Yeah, it's it's pretty crack up, really. Big man in New Zealand again. Oh, yeah, that's that's our rugby team. Why, why is it influencing yeah. big business and, and you know, you know, world scale? I guess it's mental skills coaching. Brene Brown. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's, man, it's a great book. Like, and it's you know, it's got mm. detail, but it's. Um, yeah, I just pick it up during the day. It sits on my desk. Like, I oh, just pick it up and have a flick sometimes, like, because it's, it's always got something that you can, um, you can pick up. You know, just refresh it or make you think for the day or, or whatever. Like, it's, yeah. Wonderful, mate. Um, so, where do people find Ron? Yeah, you know. Um, in my office watching footy in the gym. <laughs> no. Um, or at home with my family. They're the three places I live. But, uh, yeah, I spent a bit of time um, on Instagram, a little bit Facebook, but uh, yeah, Rowan, what am I, Coach? Coach Rowan or something uh, like that. Coach Rowan Smith or something, I think, I don't know. I don't actually know the details, but um, <laughs> yeah, like I actually don't love social media. Like if it, did, if it dropped out tomorrow, like I wouldn't care, but I also do like to keep connected with, you know, my players and um, the people that, I've kept in contact with, I, I guess in that, um, you, you never really know who's watching you, but you, mm. you do know that you're influencing. Like if you're doing good stuff, people like to see it. So that's, that's the, I guess the reason I get a little bit active on social media, keep connected. And it's definitely a recruitment tool for, mm. for me, like players drop me a line and go, Hey man, I wouldn't mind coming to your club next year. I'm like, Oh, cool. That's, that's mean. So, and how, how much um, influence has, has Dan Ben had on you getting your, your face on, on the stories? He was, he was quite proud of you and gave you a shout out on the intensive. So is that, is that his influence or, or, or your brother's or? Dan? Yeah. Um, Dan, I guess Dan's been around Real Movement for a period of time. Um, but I, I've really tried in the last, yeah, the last couple of months connected with Dan more often and, just dug right into his couple of presentations um, that he's, that he's given us. And I look forward to, yeah, him chucking out some more material around communication. Like it's, it's just such a cool angle to come from like being a, a performer, yeah. an acrobat, you know, a circus juggler, all that stuff. Like to, to use that as a communication method. And yeah, I'm a big fan of that guy. Yeah, I look forward to the video of Ryan Smith presenting to a rugby league team on stacked chairs. That's going to be that's going to be really good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I've got some work to do on my balancing skills, but um, yeah, I, I feel that creativity is not something that's natural to me. Like <laughs> about creating experiences and stuff, and something that I've evolved with over the last few years about using the our environment as a creative opportunity to, to create, to create experiences for people. Um, and I love that concept that Dan does, but I, yeah, I've got some work to do. Yeah, no, it was one of the things that landed with me, like, um, creating novel environments to get a really important point across. I was like, Oh, that's, that's really powerful. Yeah. Mate. Um, what, what would you leave us with? What's something that continually shows up in your life that always, always hits the mark or often hits the mark and you look back and go, Oh, I was doing that. It's a good question. Cheers. <laughs> it is because it's um, there's so much, there's so much. But I guess you know, co coaching, coaching, you're often looking on the outside, you know, and trying to help other people. Where my intentions in the last few years are always come back to me first. Mm -hmm. uh, trying to, you know, daily improvement to the point where, you know, sometimes I get myself overwhelmed by I want to read those books or listen to that podcast or like watch that webinar. There's so much stuff I want to throw into the, the mix, but my intention is to get better so I can help other people get better. Mm. Uh, make yeah, being accountable to myself first er, every day and chasing getting better and, 
I guess the other thing that I'm wake up every morning being grateful for the opportunity to have, you know, a, a, a young family and, and to be a footy coach to mm. like, that's pretty much like, that's pretty much me. Like it's a simple life, but that's something I'm grateful for. And yeah, chasing that, chasing that constant improvement. It's probably, probably the thing for me. Love it, mate. Well, I'll let you get on with your day, get, get back to that family and, Ricky and all that sort of stuff and I'd better head off to my, my job it's, it's a big day, got to drive to Auckland after that long weekend so yeah, thank you so much for coming on board and, and sharing your morning with me and um, yeah, I look forward to more Ryan Smith on, on the gram <laughs> I appreciate it man, you're, um, I love your podcast, you're a great, you're a great interviewer man, it's, uh, it's really easy to talk to you and you know, I could talk about this stuff forever mate, I appreciate it. Cheers bro Wicked